Text is a common form of data that we work with, and we do so using the string data type. It's actually a class in C Sharp. Now, we briefly talked about strings in Lesson 2 whenever we built our Hello World app, but we really didn't spend much time on it at all. We just talked about how strings begin and end with a double quote. So today and tomorrow, we are going to devote on strings and cover some of the fundamentals because there's no way we could cover all of the information about strings just because it's such a huge topic with a bunch of subtopics. So we're not even going to cover even a quarter of all of the information about strings, but we will get the fundamentals in, which is the most important at this particular point in time. We'll start by creating a string variable, and we can do that in two different ways, but there's really only one way that we do it. The first way is the way that nobody uses, and that is to use the actual name of the string class, and that is an uppercase S for string. And we can see that in Visual Studio, the color coding is giving us kind of a teal color for string. That's just the color that it gives for class names. So we have string, and then we need the name of the variable, which I'm going to call foo. And then we need to begin the string with double quotes. This is a string. And then we need to end it with double quotes. And then a semicolon to end the statement. Now, as I said, nobody does this because there's another way. Instead of using a capital S, we can use a lowercase s. I know it's only one keystroke, but, you know, that's one keystroke. Whenever you're typing string many times, you know, one keystroke can add up. So this is the way that pretty much everybody creates a string variable by using the lowercase s for string. This is a keyword kind of like how int was a keyword for the integer variable or the integer uh, data type. So we have a string variable. Let's go ahead and write this to a console window. And we're going to use the right line just so that it will automatically format for us. We'll pass in foo, and then I'll press control F5 to run our app. And there we have it. This is a string. All right, now don't forget that strings begin and end with double quotes. And it's not to be confused with a character that begins with a single quote. Oops. Because single quotes denote a single character. That's a good way to remember it. But we can put a single quote or an apostrophe, if you want, inside of a string. So let's say, isn't this a string? And let's add a question mark and control F5 to run, and there we have, isn't this a string? So that's perfectly fine. So what if we wanted to take this a step further and make this kind of a dialogue, you know, as far as uh, a sentence goes in the English language? And to do that, I asked, comma, and then quote, and then quote. Now, we can see already that Visual Studio doesn't like this. And if Visual Studio doesn't like this, it's a pretty good indication that the compiler isn't going to like it as well. But I'm going to go ahead and try to compile this and run it by pressing Control F5. And we're going to see that this causes a build error. And all this window asks is, well, there are errors with this build. Do you want to run the last, um, the last build that was successful? You know, very rarely do you ever want to do that, so I'm going to click no. And then we get a list of errors. Now, we have some here that are a little bit misleading. I mean, th these are actual errors that that Visual Studio is finding, but they can be alleviated very simply. But before we do that, let's look at this first error, because it's a little cryptic at first glance. It says that we have too many characters in a character literal. Well, we're not using character literals, are we? We're trying to create a string. Well, let's look at our string. We have a double quote to begin our string. Then we have some text. And then we have another double quote. You know, the double quote for our dialogue sentence is causing a problem with our code because a string begins and ends with a double quote. Well, what can we do to get a double quote within our string? Because, you know, it's perfectly valid to have 
a double quote within a string. Well, we use something called escape sequences. It's a sequence of characters that basically tells Visual Studio and the C-sharp compiler to, hey, treat this quotation mark differently than normal. Because normally, a quotation mark begins and ends a string. So we want to escape that type of functionality. Escape sequences begin with a backslash and they're usually followed by a single character. In the case of double quotes, the escape sequence is backslash double quote. So let's add a backslash before this double quote here to escape it. And then Visual Studio automatically tells us that hey that's great but we still have some issues at the end of our string so let's look at our string again as we have it now we have the beginning double quote and then we have our string we have a double quote that is escaped but then close to the end we have a double quote well we have two double quotes but visual studio is seeing that first double quote as the end of our string but that's supposed to be part of the string, not the end of it. So let's escape that as well. And then Visual Studio likes that. So let's run it. And we will see our string as it is supposed to be written in the console window. And that is perfect. Some of the other notable escape sequences are backslash T. This will generate a tab in between I and AST. So we'll see that. There we go. Uh, backslash n creates a new line. So even though this is all the same string, that backslash n creates a new line. So we have i and then on a new line, asked, isn't this a string? And then if we want a backslash within our string, the escape sequence is backslash backslash. And there we go. Now, I have a pet peeve about escape sequences. They serve a purpose, absolutely, but I don't like them, especially if I'm outputting text that is supposed to have a lot of specifically double quotes, but really any type of, of escaped character, I just don't want to escape those characters a lot. So C Sharp has something called a verbatim string, and it's basically the same thing, except we prepend the string with an at symbol. And this is going to say that this is a verbatim string. Pretty much whatever is in this string is what I want displayed. And we can see that just by adding that at sign, Visual Studio doesn't like this now because it's seeing all of our escape sequences and it's starting to have a hissy fit. But we still need to do some things here. And, you know, it's not a perfect solution but to me it's just a little bit more readable instead of escaping the double quotes with a backslash double quote we just use a double quote double quote now the only time that this gets a little hairy is kind of at the end whenever we have a double quote double quote double quote <laughs> but to me this is just a little bit easier because even if we add in a backslash that's not considered an escape sequence. So let's add this in between I and asked. And we don't have to escape it because this is a verbatim string. So if we hit control F5, then we see I backslash asked. And then we have the double quote still within our string. So this is another way that we can uh, not really escape characters or special characters within our string, but some way that we can say that we want this string to appear as is any time that we use it. The last thing we'll look at is joining multiple strings together to create a new string. Except in programming, it's not really called joining. At least as far as strings are concerned, it's called concatenating. So we are concatenating strings, not joining them. Now, concatenation requires an operation, and that means that we have a concatenation operator. But it's really easy to remember because we have seen it before. Four, just in a different context. So first, let's create two strings. This is a, that's our first string, and then our second string will just be the word string. Now, in order to concatenate these two strings together, 
we use a plus sign. That is our concatenation operator. And that makes sense because in arithmetic, the plus sign is an addition operator. We take one number and we add another number to it. Well, with strings, we take one string and then we add another string to it. So we are we take these two strings and then assign it to the foo variable. So foo is going to contain the string. This is a string. Now notice that there is no uh, space after a within our first string and before s in the second string. This is important because concatenation does not do any type of formatting for us. It simply takes the two strings and puts them together. So whenever we do our concatenation, we need to make sure our strings are formatted how we want them. So we'll add a space after a. We could put it before s, but I don't like to begin a string with a space. That's just my personal preference. And we're not limited to concatenating two strings. Now, ultimately, that's what happens because there's one operation that concatenates strings. And then if we have another string in this expression, then it takes that new string that was created from the first concatenation operation, and then it concatenates that with that third string. So let's add a third string, and it just has a single character. Now, that's fine. Even though it's just one character, we can have a string of one character. We can have a string of no characters. And did Zune just pop up? I'm sorry. Um, so this is actually what's called an empty string, at least this third string here, where there's nothing inside of a string that's called an empty string. But there's another way to specify an empty string, and this is the, the way that I do it. I use string.empty. And this is a lot more explicit, at least as far as code is concerned. Even though it's the same, this, at least whenever I'm reading it, I know without a doubt that that is supposed to be an empty string. If I look at, you know, the pair of double quotes with nothing inside of it, I have to wonder, did I intend that to be empty? Or was that supposed to have something else? So I use the string dot empty because it's absolutely explicit as to what it's supposed to be. So as long as there's a character or no characters, but just double quotes, that is a string. It doesn't matter how many characters are there. So we have this is a string and then exclamation point. And if we run that, then we will see that output as well. But we're not just limited to strings here. We can put other types of values. And the .NET framework is going to convert it to a string so that we can concatenate it with the existing string. So for example, let's use the number seven. So we will have this is a string seven and let's add a space after string so that string and seven don't run together. We'll run that and then there we see this is a string seven and the same is true for characters. Let's add an exclamation point character. Notice I'm using the single quotes so that is a character. If we run it, then it converted that character to a string. Uh, one last demonstration, let's use true. True is a Boolean value, but it too can be converted to a string, and it does so. This is a string true. So the .NET framework will see that we have a string, and then we have a plus sign. And since we can't really do anything else with a string except concatenate, it will take whatever value is there, if it's not a string, convert it to a string, and then perform that concatenation. Now, when I said that concatenation was the last thing we are going to talk about today, I lied. And I apologize because something just occurred to me, and I should have covered it in Lesson 2, but I failed to do so. So I'm going to now while it's on my mind. We need to talk about white space because as far as us, as humans are concerned, it's very important because it really determines how readable our code is. The compiler really couldn't care about white space. Well, there are some places where it, it definitely does care, like between string and foo. If we don't have a space between those two, then you know it's not going to know what string foo is. But with that space there, then the compiler knows, hey, we have a string variable called foo. But if we add multiple spaces between string and foo, 
this is going to work. This is perfectly valid code because it's going to take all of those spaces and cut it down to one space. Now, as far as we are concerned from the human aspect, this makes our code a little less easier to read because we have string, and then it looks like foo is on the same line. But, you know, we really don't know that until we put the two together or we we <laughs> we do some type of check like is that right there? Yes, it is. Okay, so you know, we need to make sure that the white space makes sense from a readable standpoint. And that's really easy to do because there's formatting automatically built into Visual Studio. So let's go ahead and add some spaces here. Uh, we can get rid of spaces in between, you know, our variable name and operators. In fact, we could get rid of all the spaces between all of these operands and operators. I won't do so because whenever we add a semicolon at the end of the statement, it's going to format this line for us. There we go. The same is true. Let's undo that. Whenever we finish a code block, and a code block is in between the opening curly brace and the closing curly brace. I'm going to get rid of the closing curly brace and re-add it, and it's going to format all of the code there. So Visual Studio does a pretty good job of formatting code for us just so that it's a little bit readable. But we can also stick things on a new line, and it's going to work just fine. So let's uh, do this whole string concatenation thing on three lines. We don't have to do it on three lines, but we can. So we have this as A, and then the plus sign, string, and then it really doesn't matter where the plus sign is as long as it's there. So I'm going to just demonstrate, you know, that, that that's you know, what it does. I'm not lying to you. Uh, I promise I'm not lying to you again. Um, so it doesn't matter where you put it as long as it's there. We can even put it all the way to the to the beginning here, and we can scoot this all the way over, and it's going to work. Now, of course, that makes our code a lot less readable, but that is something that we can do. And Visual Studio tried to format that well, and it didn't do a good job, but, you know, we messed it up to begin with. But, you know, just use... Or, or just think about white space as you're writing. For the most part, Visual Studio is going to handle it for you, and you don't have to worry about it. But whenever you're concatenating multiple strings together, and it might take up multiple lines, just kind of think about how that needs to look as far as code is concerned. Uh, we typically use indentations to show kind of the relationship between one line to the next. So let's add another variable. Let's do string bar. We'll do hello world. Now the string foo and the string bar, they are perfectly lined up that's you know typical that they aren't related together but let's go ahead and let's put uh, the string and then plus true on a new line and visual studio is automatically formatting it for us by indenting that line so it's kind of showing a relationship that this line on line 13 is part of line 12 it's just on a new line so there's some relation there if it were all the way back over there then there's kind of some ambiguity as to you know what's going on but if it's indented then you know it's a lot more visible as to how those two lines are related to one another okay i promise that's it for today no more lies at least today uh tomorrow we are going to continue talking talking about strings primarily how we can manipulate them using some of the methods of the string class because strings are objects everything in dotnet is so have a good rest of the day i will talk with you tomorrow